Chapter Eleven of the Mikado Jewel by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Chapter Eleven. Harry's Sweetheart. With the arrival of Basil Dane, life became much brighter and more lively at Beckley. The young sailor was active-minded and light-hearted, so that he was always glad to provide amusement for himself and others. He took Patricia and Mara out sailing in the ferry bay, and walked with them across the windy spaces of the moors to view various centres of interest. In the evenings, having a sweet tenor voice, he sang to them while Miss Carroll played his accompaniments, and, of course, he had much to tell them about foreign parts no one could possibly be dull while basil was in the house and even the squire left his beloved history of the culpster family to enjoy the breezy humours of his favourite nephew the old house awoke as it were from sleep to enjoy a brief holiday of innocent amusement but although basil was attentive to-morrow since he greatly wished to arouse her from those dreams which set her apart from others he gave patricia most of his company from the moment he had set eyes on her he had been attracted by the beauty of her face now that he knew her better and found that she had a heart of gold he frankly fell in love with such perfections and very wisely for patricia was a rare specimen of her sex she was not on her part averse to his wooing as of all the men she had ever met basil appeared to be the most trustworthy and fascinating it was the old story of love at first sight that miracle at which material-minded people scoff but which is a veritable truth in spite of such scepticism theodore needless to say was not pleased to see the fulfilment of his prophecy he had known the moment basil arrived that something of this silly sort so he phrased it would happen knowing nothing of love himself for his selfishness swallowed up all other qualities in his somewhat narrow nature he had scanty patience with this folly he wished to get patricia entirely to himself because of her rare psychic qualities and to do so was even willing to marry her of course by such an act he would cut himself off from all chance of acquiring the property since it was very evident that the mikado jewel would never be found theodore was certain that it had gone back to japan and there would be no chance of its being stolen a second time this being the case only by marrying his cousin could he secure beckley and carry out his design of forming a school of occultism but this ambition as has before been stated he was willing to surrender provided that he could dominate patricia and her mediumistic powers with those at his disposal he felt that he could do much to forward his selfish desires moreover and this was a factor also in his decision mara disliked him so intensely that she certainly would never marry him but none of theodore's feelings appeared in his looks and manners to reach his ends he had to play a comedy and did so with the skill of a clever actor his face was all smiles his behaviour most deferential and he carefully avoided any possible quarrel with his brother also he did not speak of his occult studies since a discussion of such things was not welcome to others theodore in fact appeared in quite a social role and seconded his brother in promoting a brighter and more active state of things in the old mansion he was clever at conjuring and gave exhibitions in the drawing-room when the girls grew weary of music and conversation and always he was polite and genial so much did he impose upon basil and mara and the squire that they believed theodore had as the saying is turned over a new leaf but patricia did not credit as genuine this too suave demeanour she knew if no one else did that the leopard could not change his spots and what is more that this particular leopard did not wish to beckley was certainly the vale of avillon for in spite of the bad weather prevailing in almost every other county in england this favoured spot preserved more or less a serene calm of course it rained at times but not very long and not very hard as the squire had said his hay crops at hendel were completely ruined by the wet and he anticipated a great loss which he could ill afford in his straitened circumstances but the flower gardens round his family seat bloomed in almost constant sunshine also when snows fell it was now close upon christmas and the hard frosts were coming 
they spread a mantle of white on the moors above but did not descend upon beckley it is true that owing to the season many of the trees in that domain were leafless but a goodly number being foreign were evergreen and still clothed themselves in leaves throughout the winter when severe conditions prevailed on the high lands the climate of this little nook by the sea maintained a mildness and warmth little short of miraculous the place might have been situated on the riviera patricia thought that these extraordinary circumstances for an english winter were due to the great red cliff which sheltered the vale during the day it drew in much heat into its breast and breathed it forth at night when the airs grew chilly it was like being warmed by a good-humoured volcano she thought for patricia after the manner of browning always humanized the forces of nature but undoubtedly she was right in her surmise for the solar fire constantly drawn to the cliff and radiated from the cliff created an artificial summer which endured throughout the year beckley was like the garden of eden for climate and fruitfulness and beauty and theodore was the intruding snake but as yet even to herself she did not dare to confess that she was a modern eve to basil's adam or if a passing thought of this nature did cross her mind she blushed and did not dwell on it if she had she would never in her maidenly confusion have been able to meet the eye of her lover yes it had come that far he was her lover of course theodore always on the watch saw that the pair were falling deeply in love daily and savagely felt that he could do nothing to prevent a happy ending to the romance the squire might want basil to marry his cousin but mara merely loved the young man in a sisterly fashion and did not dream of any closer tie colpster was not the man to force his daughter's affections even for the sake of the family so it was probable that if mara refused basil which she assuredly would do if he offered himself and if patricia accepted the young sailor mr colpster would settle the beckley property on his daughter and give up his fancy of re-establishing the family moreover he was now strangely fond of patricia and would be glad to have her for his niece by marriage look what way he could and would theodore saw that his chances of gaining either beckley or miss carroll were very small indeed it was then that he determined to seek out brenda lee and see what the future had in store for him after mara's warning he had always been haunted by a sense of ever nearing danger although he could not tell from which quarter it would come granny lee would know however as she was a clairvoyant and could look into the seeds of time as did macbeth's weird women of course in this material age most people contemptuously dismiss such things as hanky-panky but that did not matter to theodore skeptics might refuse to shape their course by such a vague chart but he knew positively from experience that under certain circumstances the devil could speak truly and if granny lee with her malignant disposition and greedy venom was not the devil who was granny lee therefore was the one to solve riddles and to granny lee theodore went a few days before christmas yet so as to impress upon his uncle that he was going on a harmless and friendly errand the young man sought him out in the seclusion of his library i am going to see isa lee and ask if she has heard anything about harry since his return to england said theodore abruptly you are going to hindle no isa so i have been told is stopping for christmas with her grandmother in that miserable hut on the moors i can go and return in three hours i should like to come with you said the squire alertly i am most anxious to know the whereabouts of harry pentreddle we must question him about the emerald i wonder if he really knows anything i am perfectly certain that he does rejoined theodore positively if he did not he would not have stayed away from isa but i do not advise you to come with me uncle george as there is deep snow on the moors and you are not so young as you were besides i can ask all necessary questions well do so if you can recover the emerald you know what your reward will be said the squire and turned again to decipher an old document which dealt with the adventures of amyas colpster 
in peru theodore shrugged his big shoulders and departed with a grimace much as he would have liked to secure the emerald if only to inherit beckley which was a kind of naboth's vineyard in his greedy eyes he felt quite sure that harry pentreddle could tell him little that would be helpful harry undoubtedly had stolen the jewel and had given it to patricia as his mother's emissary but having departed for amsterdam almost immediately he would know nothing of its unexpected loss apparently he did not even know that his mother had been so barbarously murdered if he did know he assuredly would have returned to avenge her in spite of any danger there might be to him from the guardians of the great gem and that danger was now as theodore fully believed a thing of the past the emerald had been recovered so it was only natural to suppose that the priests of the kitsuki temple would leave well alone with these thoughts in his scheming mind theodore well wrapped up in furs mounted the winding road which led to the moors the vast grassy spaces were covered more or less deeply with snow but dane accustomed to the country since his boyhood and possessing great strength made light of the drifts far away on the dazzling expanse brilliantly and blindingly bright in the sunshine he saw the many dark dots which marked the village near the cromlech where mrs lee had her home a glance backward over the cliff showed him the verdant acres of beckley and a flash of colour where late flowers still bloomed there was no snow below but only emerald swards and green woods running to the verge of the sapphire bay where the wavelets lipped the curved streak of the yellow sands the contrast between the summer he was leaving and the winter he was going into struck theodore forcibly i wish i could get it all to myself he groaned basil is out of it if he marries patricia carroll and mara hasn't the sense to look after it i may secure it after all but patricia he scowled i don't want her to become basil's wife a speech which showed that theodore both wished to have his cake and eat it since he wanted both the girl and the property however it was useless to moralize over possibilities so dane resolutely struck across the moors and ploughed manfully through the drifts after a mile or so he came to the high road up which tourists came to view the rocking stone and the cromley this was comparatively clear and he had no further difficulty in gaining his goal swiftly walking and in spite of his great bulk theodore could walk swiftly when he chose he soon arrived at the handful of houses sheltered immediately under the brow of the gently swelling hill or boss which marked the highest point of the moors it was a most unlikely place for a village as there seemed to be no chance of its inhabitants gaining food but they acted as guides to tourists drove them in vehicles from and to handle shepherded groves of export ponies and flocks of hardy sheep and if rumour was true employed much of their spare time in poaching the village boatwain was its name had not a good reputation in general and amongst its inhabitants granny lee in particular had the worst name theodore soon found the tumble-down house in which she lived and at the door came upon isa lee just stepping so she said to post a letter dane saw his opportunity and took it immediately you are writing to harry he observed looking at the tall robust deep-bosomed woman who always reminded him of wagnerian heroines with her fair flaxen hair and brunhilde aspect isa evidently saw no reason to deny the truth yes sir she replied in a deep contralto voice which boomed like a bell is harry still abroad yes sir he is stopping at amsterdam hoping to get a ship does he know of his mother's death yes answered isa i told him and sent him the papers what does he say he intends to return here and pray by her grave theodore shrugged his shoulders cynically he had much better avenge her death was his remark he wants to said isa stolidly but he says that he can't guess who killed her and does not know how to begin he is very sorrowful out over the death mr dane as he loved his mother he doesn't seem to be so very sorry snapped theodore sharply or he would return and learn who murdered her 
i am writing to him to advise him to do so said the woman quickly oh don't think that harry is hard sir he is he is afraid of what i don't know he refuses to tell me sir dane knew very well when she said this that patricia's suggestion was a true one pentreddle had evidently stolen the jewel and now feared lest he should be assassinated but with the recovery of the jewel by one of the priests and he believed that there was more than one on the hunt all danger had passed isa he said impressively go back and add a postscript to your letter telling harry that there is now no danger and that the squire my uncle wishes to see him what about sir asked isa suddenly and with an anxious look he wants to talk to him about mrs pentreddle's death she was our housekeeper you know yes sir and a grand funeral the squire gave her said the woman with a flush for like all the lower orders she attached great weight to post-mortem ceremonies he has been kind well he wants to be kinder said theodore not hesitating to tell a lie in order to gain his ends he has some idea of who killed martha and wishes to talk about it to harry who should avenge his mother's death will you go back and add that to your letter yes sir oh yes sir said the girl eagerly i am very glad harry will be to hear it as he has been fretting dreadfully over his mother's death but he did not return because of this danger whatever it is do you know sir i can guess answered theodore significantly so you can tell harry that he can come quite safely to england now go and write your letter and say that he is to come back at once the squire wishes to see him at beckley as he has news for him meanwhile i shall speak with your grandmother isa nodded and stepped aside to allow her grand visitor to enter the house although it was scarcely worthy of the name it was rather a hovel and possessed only three rooms a large one used for all living purposes and two tiny bedrooms the old hag she was nothing else sat beside a small fire smoking a short-stemmed clay pipe and only vouchsafed dane a grunt when he greeted her she was about eighty-six years of age but looked even older with her wrinkled copper-coloured face and scanty white hair streaming from under a thrum cap her eyes were small black and piercing and full of vivid life for the rest she was hunched up in a basket chair stroking a large black cat and looked a typical witch of james's time perhaps she dressed for the part and lived up to it black cat and all for she made much money in summer by telling fortunes to tourists but undoubtedly her appearance was so old and wicked that she would have tasted of the tar-barrel in stuart days almost without the formality of a trial granny lee was a witch in grain if ever there was a witch good day said theodore sitting down on a chair with no back while isa went into an adjoining bedroom to add the postscript to her letter how do you find yourself this weather granny mr lee if you please snarled the old woman glaring at him in a malignant way and removing the pipe from her almost toothless gums mrs lee then be it mrs prindle lee if you like said dane who had his reasons for keeping her in a good temper how are you how should i be in this damned weather i'm all aches and pains and and they dreaded rheumatics you shouldn't attend so many sabbaths chuckled theodore loosening his fur coat riding a broomstick with no clothes on is dangerous at your age leave my age alone drat ye growled the amiable old lady beginning to cut a fresh bill of tobacco with a clasp knife as to sabbaths i don't believe in em or i'd ha gone long ago there ain't any now and i don't believe as there ever was i don't go to them but they come to me theodore cast a bold look round the miserable room are they here now granny lee chuckled in her turn <laughs> mine don't need to show when you're here mr dane you brought your lot along with you and the biggest of them is looking over your shoulder at this blessed moment the big man turned his head but of course not being gifted with mediumistic powers could see nothing i wish i could have a look at him he said regretfully what is he 
just your thought grown big theodore nodded quite comprehendingly of course thoughts create beings on the astral plane out of the essence what special thoughts there's lots of them and none of them pleasant interrupted mrs lee pointing with her pipe stem yon's greed of what belongs to other folk and he's not a small one then there's selfishness quite a giant and hatred and lust and ambition and murder why murder i haven't murdered any one said dane quickly and coolly it's in your mind that brother of yours theodore ground his teeth i'd like to strangle him he growled only i might be caught yes i dare say the murder thought is there knowing what he did about occult matters he had not the least doubt but what mrs lee saw his thoughts made visible since she possessed the astral vision what the celt calls second sight and could behold the unseen ordinary matter-of-fact people would laugh at mrs lee's pretensions but dane knew that they were only too truthful and that she actually saw the hideous offspring of his brain with which his evil passions had surrounded him however he put the delight of conversing generally with this mistress of black magic aside for the moment since at any moment isa might finish writing her postscript and come out it was time to get to business and he did so without delay i feel there is some danger near me he said abruptly and i want you to see what it is granny laid aside her pipe and stretched forth a skinny hand get me the ring you are wearing i must get your condition to see she said dane pulled off his signet ring and passed it along as he knew that otherwise she could not come into contact with his magnetism mrs lee put it to her wrinkled forehead and closed her beady eyes after a few moments she began to speak slowly listening at times as if some of the viewless things around her were speaking it's danger from above she muttered what danger i can't tell that shell of yours which holds your wicked soul is stretched out as flat as a pancake how does that happen i can't tell drat ye but it won't happen if you don't let it come into the house what is it granny listened for a moment a voice says that you're not to know but how can i guard myself if i'm not to know protested theodore in a vexed tone what is the use of warning me unless the remedy suggested granny shook her weird old head there's innocence against you and them as works for you can't get over get over what the barrier of innocence don't ask me more questions for the mist is hiding all she handed back his ring what i get plainly is don't let it come into the house but hang it raged theodore what is it i can't tell drat ye said granny again and resumed her pipe theodore gave her a shilling and left the hut more doubtful than ever his oracle as an oracle should be was too mystical for everyday comprehension End of chapter 11chapter twelve of the mikado jewel by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perrard chapter twelve a japanese diplomatist if count akira was indeed anxious to visit beckley he certainly did not betray much alacrity in accepting the squire's cordial invitation he did write to the effect that he would be delighted to come but postponed his arrival until the second week in january official business he stated would keep him employed during the next few weeks and he would be unable to leave his chief consequently there was only a family party present at the christmas festivities mr colpster being of a conservative nature always kept these up in an old-fashioned hospitable style indeed he invited several friends to join on this occasion as his nephew was at home but the friends having their own families and own festivities declined to put in an appearance the squire was not sorry as he disliked the trouble of entertaining visitors 
as it was he gave the servants a dinner and bestowed coats and blankets and hampers of wholesome food on the inhabitants of handel boatswain and the other hamlets all of which had at one time belonged to dead and gone colpsters for this reason did the squire act so generously and he hoped when the emerald was recovered for he refused to believe that it had gone back to its shrine in japan that the future good fortune which would come with it would enable him to buy back the lost lands meanwhile by acting as the lord of the lost manor he retained the feudal allegiance of the villagers there was something pathetic in the way in which the old man persistently looked forward to the rehabilitation of his family he made sure that the mikado jewel would come back he felt certain that the land would be recovered and was convinced that when he passed away the husband of mara would start a new dynasty of colpsters through the female branch whose glories would outshine the ancient line but who mara was to marry did not seem quite clear he spoke to the girl on the subject and suggested that she should become the wife of theodore or basil mara shuddered when he mentioned the first name and her father noted the repugnance the shudder revealed i don't approve much of theodore myself he said apologetically as he is extremely selfish but he has no bad qualities which would lead him to waste money and moreover he loves this place you might do worse dear if theodore was the only man on earth and offered me a kingdom i would not marry him said mara speaking decisively and in a firm way which contrasted strongly with her usual indifference he is a bad man my dear child he has no vices he neither drinks nor gambles nor if he had all the vices of which a human being is capable interrupted mara loudly i would not mind but his bad qualities are inhuman he is selfish and dangerous and all his time is given to black magic the squire laughed incredulously i know that theodore dabbles in such things he said disbelievingly but it is all imagination mara there is no such a thing as any power to be obtained in that way yes there is i know said mara looking at her father significantly can you prove what you say my dear no and i don't want to talk any more about the matter i won't marry my cousin theodore even if you leave the property away from me i don't want to do that you are my heiress and my idea was for you to marry your cousin then he could take your name and i shan't marry theodore cried mara for the third time and stamped basil then you can have no fault to find with basil i haven't father but mara stopped and a strange smile spread over her small pale face i shall ask basil to marry me if you like she said in an abrupt way he can but say no he won't say no my dear basil loves me too well to thwart my wishes but it is his part to woo and yours to listen let him ask i should have to wait a long time before he did that said mara dryly i wish to know the best or worst at once and she left the room still smiling strangely mr colpster could not understand why she smiled but then neither he nor any one else understood the girl who seemed to hang between two worlds the seen and the unseen without making use of either so indifferent was her attitude towards all things as it happened patricia was busy attending to the servants as it was her housekeeping hour mara was thus enabled to find basil alone for when miss carroll was available he constantly followed at her heels like a faithful and adoring dog but patricia would not appear for some time so the sailor read the daily paper in the smoking-room and solaced himself for the absence of the eternal feminine with his pipe mara knew where to find him and entered in her light noiseless way to perch on the arm of his chair like a golden butterfly without any preamble she plunged into the reason for her intrusion into bachelor quarters basil will you marry me she asked coldly and calmly and unexpectedly 
looking on his cousin as a child the young man thought she was joking and laughed when he answered of course will we start now for the church on the moors where all the colsters have been married i am in earnest basil she said seriously so am i he rejoined lightly only it will be the marriage of bottom and titania with you my airy elf and he slipped his arm round her waist looking at her with a smile on his handsome face mara who disliked being touched even by patricia much more by this confident male thing as she called basil in her mind slipped off the arm of the chair and floated like thistle-down into the centre of the room don't be silly basil i have just come from my father he wants me to marry you or theodore i hate theodore and would sooner die than become his wife but i told father that i would ask you to become my husband basil saw that she really meant what she said and moreover knew of his uncle's strong desire to unite the two branches of the dwindling colpster family laying aside his pipe he grew red to the roots of his closely cropped hair i i don't want to he stuttered ungallantly and feeling very much confused i i hope you don't mind a wintry smile gleamed on the girl's white face i should have minded a great deal had you really wished to marry me then why ask me demanded basil much relieved but still confused to set my father's mind at rest replied mara quietly and as self-possessed as her cousin was disturbed now that you have declined i can tell him and she flitted towards the door but mara basil rose and ran across the room to catch her arm how can you be certain that i mean what i say she turned on him with an amazed look you think that i am a child basil but i am not i have eyes and ears and common sense you will marry patricia will you not young dane grew redder than ever i-i have said nothing to her he stammered nervously she-she doesn't know that i-that i mara's scornful laughter stopped his further speech and she became quite friendly for so bloodless a person you silly boy she cried ruffling what hair the barber had left him patricia knows but how can she because she is a woman said mara impatiently women are not like men and don't require everything to be put into words i saw from the moment you met patricia that you loved her i'm glad i'm glad she ended with conviction as i don't want to marry you or anyone else basil with lover-like selfishness did not pay attention to the end of her speech but to the earlier part if you saw then miss carroll must have seen miss carroll mocked mara with dancing eyes why not patricia ah oh, the shy sailor blushed i shouldn't care to call her that his cousin took him by the coat lapels and shook him with frail strength silly creature if you have not the courage to take what you can get patricia will have nothing to do with you and women like a bold lover i don't believe she will ever return my love sighed basil dolefully oh as to that she returns it already mara he flushed again this time with sheer delight do you think i don't think i know and i'm very glad for patricia is a darling i hope that father who is as fond of her as i am will give her beckley on condition that she marries you who can't say both to a goose basil looked serious and sighed again i am sorry to upset uncle george's plans for he has always been kind to me but not even for the estate could i give up miss that is patricia no one wants you to give up either said mara impatiently father will no doubt give you back late no dear that would not be right you are the heiress and what would i do with it keep a boarding-house or start a convent of nuns i would much rather have a small income and be able to move round as i please you will marry some day mara mr wright will come along mr wright will never come along cried mara and coloured crimson which was unusual unless he comes from the other world what do you mean asked the sailor greatly puzzled by this weird speech 
oh never mind retorted mara pitying his lack of comprehension sit down and dream of your patricia i am going to tell father that my heart is broken and shooting a whimsical glance at the amazed and startled basil she slipped out of the room five minutes later miss carroll arrived with her household work completed for the day in spite of what mara had told him basil would not follow the path she had pointed out he was rather more attentive than usual to patricia and gave her to understand that he would wreck continence for her sake but the modesty of a man which is greater than that of a woman kept his tongue quiet and his eyes unintelligent patricia did not entirely approve of this restrained attitude as she knew that he loved her and wished to be told so in plain english she could not understand why he did not speak but basil himself understood very well he waited for patricia to give him a sufficiently strong hint that she adored him and then he could lay himself at her feet it did not seem right so basil thought to act on what he had learned from mara as that would be taking advantage of illicit intelligence but for the sailor's rigorous views of honour the situation could have been adjusted then and there all the same it was not because she could not speak and he would not as for mara she returned to her father and demonstrated to him very plainly that her cousin wished to marry miss carroll and that when the time came he would do so colpster felt annoyed mara could not marry basil and would not marry theodore so his plans for the future well-being of the family were all disarranged what would you say if i gave beckley to basil he said pointedly he could marry patricia you know and take my name i should be very glad replied mara quietly well then i won't said her father greatly annoyed you are the last of the direct line and should have the property i wouldn't know what to do with it you could live here when i am gone mara raised her faint eyebrows all alone she questioned you know i would not allow theodore to stay and that patricia would go with basil who is always moving round the world oh i couldn't what's to be done then asked the squire helplessly mara threw her arms round his neck a rare demonstration of affection from so usually a self-controlled girl wait she whispered wait and see what is about to happen what is about to happen i don't know but something is coming along to change all our lives how do you know i can't tell you i only feel that there is something in the air to oh colpster grew angry more of your occult rubbish i wish you were an ordinary girl mara and not a dreaming visionary i shall wait until the emerald comes back and then you must make up your mind to marry theodore since basil's affections are engaged mara reflected and thought how very certain theodore was that the emerald had gone back to japan never to return the recollection gave her a chance of pacifying her father and of securing her freedom very well then she said quietly when you get the emerald father i shall marry him and in this way the affair was settled for the time being but think as she might mara could not guess how her father expected the mikado jewel to return to the colpster family and even if it did she could not understand how its possession would affect things in any way meanwhile the days and weeks passed by and the time drew near for the visit of count akira mara although she said nothing was looking forward to his arrival why she did not know for as a rule she was quite indifferent to those who came to beckley hall in her heart however she felt that he was coming into her life either for good or ill and it was this feeling which made her say to her father that a change was about to take place but she could not have put her feeling into words and did not attempt to do so with a fatalism which was inherent in her character she waited passively certain that what was meant to be would certainly become when the hour struck there was nothing more to be said theodore had duly told his uncle of the interview with isa lee although for obvious reasons he said nothing about the seance with the grandmother the squire was therefore anxiously awaiting the arrival of harry pentreddle as he then hoped to learn how and why the young man had stolen the emerald 
also he might be able to guess who had snatched it from the hand of patricia and if so could then tell in whose possession it now was a great deal depended upon what pentreddle had to say and colpster watched daily for his coming but count akira was the first to arrive and in attending to a new and fascinating guest the squire almost forgot his anxiety to hear the evidence of young pentreddle the japanese came late in the evening having arrived at hendel by the express to be driven to batley by basil the young man went to meet his friend and brought him to the hall in time to dress for dinner it was not until the meal was in progress that mara set eyes on him and then she was so excited by his presence although she did not show her feelings that she could scarcely eat what she had expected vague as it was had come true this man from the far east was the man who would change her life into what he would change it and down what new path he would lead her she could not say all she knew was that with the hour had come the man count akira was a small neat person with a bronze-coloured skin a clean-shaven face black hair and black eyes and a very dignified manner at the first sight he did not look particularly impressive as the european evening dress did not entirely suit his aggressively oriental appearance but when those gathered in the drawing-room came to notice his keen dark eyes so observant and piercing to listen to his carefully worded speech and to look at his nobly formed head they became aware that he was no ordinary man race was apparent in his gestures and glances and dominating manner so quiet yet imperious he came of a noble line accustomed to rule and his personality made itself felt more and more as something strong and dangerous while the hours passed he was the past the present the future of the island empire the epitome of japan the representative of the highest type of the yellow race filled with far-reaching ambitions is it true that you worship the sun in japan asked theodore tactlessly akira turned his shrewd eyes on the speaker and smilingly displayed a set of snowy teeth some do and some don't he replied evasively but i assure you mr dane that if you ever saw the sun in england you would worship him also and with very good reason oh we get the sun here said the squire patriotically you get a name but not the real central planet said akira with a shrug clouds and mist obscure his rays only in the east does the true sun exist is that not so dane he spoke to basil whom he always addressed in this way although he was more ceremonious with theodore it is assented the sailor with a laugh and yet akira when under your painfully blue skies and in your blazing sunshine i have often longed for the cooling mists of england you so despise that is quite poetical smiled patricia sailors are always poetical although they don't show that side to landsmen the solitary spaces of sea and sky when one is driven back on oneself to think out high things is enough to make any man poetical well said mara shrewdly if sailors don't show that side to landsmen they probably show it to landswomen is that not so basil and she mischievously glanced from him to patricia and back again to some women replied basil briefly and colouring through his tan what when a sailor has a wife in every port sneered theodore then aware that he had said more than he ought to in the presence of ladies he quickly turned to akira perhaps count you will tell us about japan the little man blinked his keen eyes and politely assented he made himself comfortable and in many-coloured words placed fairyland before their eyes with great charm of manner he told of cool buddhist temples wherein weird ceremonies take place he related the delightful legend of jiso sama that kindly god who protects dead children he pictured the vivid life of toy cities all colour and movement and drew the attention of his fascinated hearers to the charm of japanese and chinese lettering which lend themselves to fantastic and odd decoration after a time he gave a description of a pilgrimage he had made to fuji that sacred mountain which appears in a thousand and one pictures of dai nippon my country with fujiyama 
left out is like hamlet without the prince he said smiling that mountain is the guardian genius of the land then he told about the rice fields with their delicate springing green of the cherry orchards in blossom of the pine forest where fox women lurked and sketched out many charming legends his talk was like a page of lafcadio hearn and mara hung breathlessly on his words as he proceeded her breath became quick and short and her eyes grew larger she looked at the narrator through him past him as though all he described were passing before her like a panorama of bygone centuries suddenly she clapped her hands i remember i remember she cried rising unsteadily to her feet your land is my land i remember at last and stopping suddenly she sank unconscious at the feet of the astonished japanese End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the mikado jewel by fergus hume this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter 13. The Unexpected. Next day, Mara was quite her old and different self. With feminine craft, she denied what she had said, even though five witnesses were ready to repeat the words. I didn't know what I was saying, said Mara impatiently. Of course, the heat was too much for me. The heat? repeated her father in january beckley isn't england my nerves are out of order count akira had some funny japanese scent on his handkerchief theodore was looking at me and that always upsets me and in this way she made idle excuses none of which would hold water i wish she would leave me alone she ended angrily as there was nothing else for it she was left alone and the queer episode was passed over mara was polite to the japanese and nothing more but her eyes were constantly following him about and she came upon him by design in unexpected places akira was too shrewd not to notice that he was an object of interest to this pale golden-haired english maid and inwardly was puzzled to think why she should pursue him in this secretive fashion mara everlastingly inquired about japan and about its people she wished to know the manners and customs of the inhabitants and entreated the count to draw word pictures of far eastern landscapes but he observed that she never asked him questions when any one else was present with a delicate sense of chivalry he kept silent about the secret understanding which her odd conduct had brought about between them for there was an understanding without doubt akira found himself wondering at times if she was really english for towards him at all events she did not display the world-wide reserve for which the island race of the west is famous of course squire colpster seized the first opportunity to question his guest about the emerald but akira professed that he knew little more than the facts that there was such a stone and that it had been stolen some months before from the temple i have been to kitsuki said the count as my religion is shinto and in izumo is the oldest of our shrines a very wonderful building it is and was built in legendary ages by order of the sun goddess but the same temple surely does not exist now oh no it has been rebuilt twenty-eight times and the squire interrupted him with an exclamation i remember lafgario hearn says that in one of his books he was a very clever man and loved our people replied akira quietly yes yes colpster nodded absently it is strange that he did not say anything about the mikado jewel it is not generally shown to strangers explained the japanese i have seen it myself of course what is it like like a chrysanthemum blossom of green jade with an emerald in the centre mr colpster i believe it was given to the shrine by one of our emperors called go yojo it was and he received it from shogun layasu akira fixed his sharp black eyes on the tired face of his host you seem pardon me to know a great deal about this jewel he observed inquiringly 
i ought to the emerald belonged to our family centuries ago you astonish me i thought i would cried the squire triumphantly yes an ancestor of mine gave the emerald to queen elizabeth and she sent it through an english pilot called will adams to akbar the emperor of india adams however was wrecked on your coasts count and presented the jewel to iasu how very interesting said akira his usually passive oriental face betraying his wonder thank you for telling me all this mr colpster i must relate it to the priests of the kitsuki temple when i return to my own land i do so in a month or two he added courteously but the jewel is now lost so i understand i read the report of the death of your housekeeper colpster gazed in astonishment at the little man did that interest you naturally rejoined akira unmoved seeing that her death was connected with the mikado jewel are you sure that it is the same asked colpster breathlessly assuredly from the description i expect the thief whosoever he was brought the emerald to london but who stole it from miss carroll akira shrugged his shoulders and spread out his small hands alas i do not know but you should mr colpster seeing that the thief proposed to transfer it to your housekeeper through miss carroll he looked very directly at his host as he spoke the squire reflected for a few minutes i will be frank with you count he observed earnestly that emerald brought good luck to our family and since it has left our possession we have had misfortunes and losses i wish to get back the jewel and gave basil a sum of money to offer to buy it back interrupted akira nodding yes i know you sent him on a dangerous errand mr colpster but for me he would have been murdered as perhaps you know basil told me this story said colpster drawing himself up stiffly but i cannot really agree with you as to the danger i merely offered to buy back what belonged to an ancestor of mine your ancestor parted with it said akira readily and rather dryly so as the stone has become a sacred one it was impossible for the priest to take money for it i know dane had nothing to do with its disappearance ah the squire became cautious i don't know who had anything to do with the theft i wish i did what then i would seek out the thief and regain the jewel by your own showing the thief parted with the emerald to miss carroll was akira's quiet remark that it was taken from her is strange oh i don't think so count some thief saw miss carroll looking at it you remember of course the details given at the inquest and snatched it akira was silent for a few moments mr colpster he said earnestly if you are wise you will make no attempt to regain this stone it brought your family good luck centuries ago but if it comes into your possession again it will bring bad luck how do you know i don't know for certain i don't even know why it was snatched from miss carroll or where it is now said akira coldly but i do know he added with great emphasis that since the emerald has been adapted to certain uses in the shinto temple at kitsuki the powers it possesses must be entirely changed oh i don't believe it has such powers said the squire roughly yet you believe that it will bring you good luck said akira with a dry little cough isn't that rather illogical sir mr colpster could find no rejoinder to this very leading question and dropped the subject it was very plain that akira knew very little about the matter and also it was dangerous to speak to him on the subject if indeed the jewel was in the possession of a london thief it might be recovered sooner or later and if akira knew that it had again passed into the possession of the colpster family he might get his ambassador to claim it for japan the squire rather regretted that he had spoken of the matter at all since his explanation might arouse his guest's curiosity but as the days passed away and akira did not again refer to the abruptly terminated conversation colpster thought that he was mistaken the japanese really was indifferent to the loss of the jewel and no doubt had never given the subject a second thought but the squire determined 
should he learn anything from harry pentreddle to keep his knowledge to himself akira doesn't care he meditated but one never knows if i can get the emerald by some miracle he may want it for kitzuki again i shall hold my tongue for the future i was a fool to speak of the matter having decided to act in this manner he warned theodore and basil and mara not to refer in any way to the mikado jewel yet strangely enough he did not warn the person who knew most to hold her tongue it therefore came about that one day while patricia was showing the gardens to akira he abruptly mentioned the subject of the inquest and incidentally touched on her adventure in hyde park were you not afraid miss carroll yes and no i was not afraid until the emerald was taken from me said patricia frankly why asked the count politely and with seeming indifference she hesitated i fear you will think me silly then in reply to his wave of a hand that such an idea would never enter his head she added hastily when i held the emerald i felt a power radiating out from it ah the japanese started in spite of his usual self-command then you have occult powers and sight and feeling and hearing i have not replied patricia vexed with herself that she had spoken so freely i am a very commonplace person indeed count i felt that feeling because i was worried and hungry naturally muttered akira to himself you get in touch with it when the physical body is weak get in touch with what asked patricia crossly for she began to think that this beady-eyed little man was making game of her with what you saw i shan't say anything more about the matter patricia turned away with great dignity i'm sorry i spoke at all your secret is safe with me miss carroll it isn't a secret mr colpster and his two nephews know i don't suppose they understand mr theodore dane does snapped miss carroll fractiously for the persistence of the man was getting on her nerves yes said akira with a ghostly smile in a way but he doesn't know enough pity for him that he doesn't what are you talking about count nonsense he replied promptly after all miss carroll i am here to play i wonder you came here at all to such a quiet place oh i don't care for orgies miss carroll but if you ask me i wonder also why i am here patricia felt that he was speaking truthfully and turned on him with a look of amazement from all she had seen of the small japanese she judged that he was a man who knew his own mind as she looked by some telepathic process he guessed what was in hers sometimes i do he answered but on this occasion i don't exactly and he drawled the last word slowly patricia almost jumped you are a very uncomfortable man she remarked the east and the west dear lady they never meet without misunderstandings this cryptic remark closed the conversation and they went in to afternoon tea akira said no more nor did he explain his puzzling conversation in the least however he still remembered it for every time he looked at patricia he smiled so enigmatically that the mother which is in every woman made her wish to slap him and send him to bed without any supper that same evening in the drawing-room a strange thing took place which made patricia wonder more than ever theodore had been performing some conjuring tricks with cards at which akira smiled politely basil had sung and she had played a sonata of beethoven feeling tired no doubt of shakespeare and the musical glasses mr colpster had stolen to his study to look at his beloved family tree the young people had the drawing-room to themselves as all save mara who invariably declined to contribute to the gaiety of any evening had done his or her part it was the turn of the japanese amuse us in some way count commanded patricia crossing to a sofa and throwing herself luxuriously on the silken cushions alas i am so foolish i know not how to amuse i have told you so much of my own country that you must be tired no 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 cried mara 
with shining eyes and an alert manner i never grow weary of hearing about japan why asked the count half closing his eyes mara's face became strange and cold i don't know she said in a hesitating manner i seem to know japan but mara cried basil staring you have never been there all the same i know it and especially i know the temple of kitsuki ah but you were there put in theodore glancing at the count whose eyes were curiously intent upon the girl's pale face when he asked suddenly she went in her astral body in search for the mikado jewel and don't talk of these things interrupted mara in an angry tone the count doesn't want to hear such rubbish of course it is all rubbish said akira promptly but patricia mindful of his afternoon conversation did not believe that he spoke as he felt ah sneered theodore quietly you are one of the scoffers yet i thought that the east believed in such things we believe in much we never talk about replied akira calmly then there was a pause until he suddenly produced from his pocket a bamboo flute i can play this he said with his eyes on mara as though he addressed himself to her it is a simple japanese instrument have you a drum basil who was addressed laughed i don't think so there's the dinner gong that will do said akira serenely would you mind getting it and beating it rhythmically like a tom-tom softly of course so as not to drown the notes of my flute and a hand-bell he added casting his looks round the room you are arranging an orchestra laughed basil going out to fetch the gong here is a bell cried mara taking a small silver hand-bell from a table covered with knick-knacks hold it please but what am i to do with it asked the girl bewildered the music i play will tell you said akira somewhat grimly and then patricia began to see that there was some meaning in all this preparation more that the same was in some hidden way connected with mara however she said nothing but waited events presently basil tall and slim returned carrying the brazen gong and set down to flourish the stick punch and judy said basil now for it akira said nothing he looked at patricia and theodore who were staring at him with astonishment and at basil laughing over the gong and finally at mara who held the handbell and appeared puzzled suddenly the japanese rose from his seat and crossing to the fire threw something into it immediately a thick white smoke poured into the room and a strong perfume came to patricia's nostrils which seemed to be familiar the incense of moses she heard theodore mutter hang it the fellow does know something of these things mara also smelt the perfumed smoke her eyes grew fixed her nostrils dilated and as patricia had seen in theodore's room she began to make a shaking motion with both hands and as formerly she closed them together holding the silver bell mouth downward as the fragrant smoke was wafted through the room the shrill piping of the flute was heard and basil according to his instructions began to beat a low muffled monotonous accompaniment on the gong the music sounded weird and eastern and was unlike anything patricia had ever heard before the stupefying incense and the smoke and the sobbing flute waiting above the throbbing of the gong made her head swim suddenly mara as if she was moving in her sleep rose slowly and walked into the centre of the room there she began to move with swaying motion in a circle shaking the silver bell with closed hands her feet scarcely made any figures as she only walked rapidly round and round but the upper part of her body swung from side to side and bent backward and forward it was like an indian notch weird and uncanny basil seemed to think so for he stopped his measured beating but the smoke still wreathed itself through the room in serpentine coils the flute shrilled loud and piercing and mara danced as in a dream 
all at once she reeled and the bell crashed on the floor basil flung down the gong and sprang forward she is fainting he cried angrily catching mara in his arms akira what the devil does this mean she is ill no no said mara as the flute stopped and the scent of the incense grew faint i am not ill i am i am what have i been doing and she looked vacantly round the room akira laid aside his flute and spoke with suppressed excitement you have been performing the miko dance he said trying to control himself miko the dance of the miko cried mara stretching out her hand i no i remember the dance of the divineress at last at mara you are ill cried basil roughly and catching her by the arm he hurried her still protesting out of the room what does it mean asked patricia who had risen don't you know asked akira looking at theodore no said dane puzzled and a trifle odd when mara smells that scent she always dances in that queer fashion but i never saw her keep it up for so long as she has done to-night where did you get that incense it is an old japanese incense said akira carelessly then he turned to patricia i now know why i have been brought here he said i don't understand stammered the girl nervously i shall explain i did not intend to come to beckley but i was compelled to come you with your sixth sense should know what i mean miss carroll i wondered why i was brought to this out-of-the-way place now i know it was to meet a former miko of the temple of kitsuki oh yes i am sure i know now why miss colpster declared that she remembered my country and loved to hear me talk about it she is a reincarnation of the dancing priestess who lived ages since the province of izumo do you believe that asked patricia scornfully akira nodded all japanese believe in reincarnation he said in a decisive tone it is the foundation of their belief you believe also theodore to whom he spoke nodded yes and i wish i wish he turned pale akira looked at him imperiously wish nothing he said she is not for you she is not for the west she is for dai nippon End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the mikado jewel by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by Matt perard chapter fourteen the jewel it was judged best by all concerned to keep the episode of the miko dance from mr colpster since he undoubtedly would have been very angry had he known of the strain to which mara's nervous system had been subjected not that the girl suffered any ill effects but she was extremely tired and remained in bed for the greater part of the next day patricia attended to her tenderly but could learn little from her as to why she had acted in so strange a way under the influence of the incense and the music but she intimated vaguely that the dance had reawakened her recollections of a previous life when she was not mara colpster but quite another person miss carroll was quite distressed by what she regarded as an hallucination and privately consulted basil the next morning after breakfast i am greatly annoyed myself said dane frowning akira should not have acted in the way he did without consulting me you would not have given your consent to the experiment said patricia certainly not mara is too highly strung to be subjected to these things and might easily lose her reason it is just as well that we have decided not to tell my uncle he would be furious and then there would be trouble with akira who has not the best of tempers under his cool exterior but why do you call it an experiment can't you see no i merely think that akira wished to give us a specimen of japanese music and it influenced mara 
as you saw perhaps we have been too hard on akira and he did not know what she would do if he did not intend something to happen why did he throw that incense on the fire asked patricia meaningly i can't say unless it was to heighten the dramatic effect of his silly nonsense retorted basil whose temper was still hot it was to revive mara's memory about what about her past life in japan basil stared at her surely miss carroll you don't believe in what akira said last night he observed with some displeasure and stiffly don't you patricia looked at him keenly and the young sailor grew red well he said at length there is no doubt that much common sense is to be found in the belief of reincarnation i have been so long in the east that i don't scoff at it so much as western people do all the same i do not go so far as to say that i entirely believe in it but you you who have never been east of suez you can't possibly credit the fact that mara some hundreds of years ago was a priestess in japan patricia looked straight out of the horizon at the azure sea and the bright line of the distant horizon i dislike these weird things she said after a pause they are uncomfortable to believe and since i have known your brother theodore i dislike them more than ever as he makes bad use of what he knows i am certain of that does he really know anything asked basil sceptically yes said patricia decidedly i really believe he has certain powers although they are not so much on the surface as mine every one according to him has these powers latent but they require to be developed i don't want mine to be brought to the surface as my own idea is to live a quiet and ordinary life basil's eyes had a look in them which asked if she wished to live her ordinary life alone all he said however was i quite agree with patricia nodded absently being too much taken up with her own thoughts to observe his expression as i therefore have a belief in such things she continued and a belief which has been more or less proved to my mind by the strange feelings i experienced while holding the mikado jewel i see no reason to doubt the doctrine of reincarnation that seems to me better than anything else to answer the riddle of life mara is certainly as you must admit a strange girl very strange indeed assented basil readily unlike other girls she has always so she told me went on patricia steadily been trying to remember her dreams by which i think she means her previous lives she could never grasp them until last night then the music and the incense brought back her memories they opened the doors in fact which to most people you and i for instance are closed then you really believe she lived in japan centuries ago asked basil in rather an odd tone yes i do replied miss carroll firmly although i know that many people would laugh if i said so this morning mara is staying in bed and will not speak much but i gather that the past has all returned to her remember how she loved to hear count akira's stories and how she followed him about he noticed that and so acted as he did last night but why did he think of the miko dance in connection with mara theodore confessed to me oh patricia blushed i should not call him by his christian name the young man suppressed a pang of jealousy i dare say you do so because you hear us all calling one another by our christian names i often wonder he added cautiously that you do not call me basil patricia blushed still deeper and waved the question i have to tell you what your brother said she remarked stiffly he related to count akira how mara danced in that weird manner when she smelt certain incense that gave the count a hint and he acted upon it as you saw she paused then turned to face basil what is to be done now the sailor had already made up his mind in the first place my uncle must not be told 
as he would make trouble in the second i shall take akira to hendle to-day sightseeing so that he may not meet mara in the third i shall hint that it would be as well seeing the effect his presence has on mara that he should terminate his visit do you approve yes said patricia nodding you are taking the most practical way out of the difficulty there is one thing i am afraid of however what is that mara may fall in love with count akira if indeed she is not in love with him already what with that japanese cried basil furiously and his racial hatred became pronounced at once that would never do she must not see him again he is bound to return here so she must see him can't you keep her in her room until akira goes patricia shook her head mara is difficult to manage however although she may love the count he may not care for her let us hope so all we can do is to act as you suggest now we must go and see after the dinner basil would have liked to detain her to talk on more absorbing topics but the question of mara and her oddities was so very prominent that he decided against chatting about more personal matters with a sigh he watched her disappear and then went away to seek out akira and take him out of the house for a few hours the japanese with all his astuteness did not fathom the reason why he was asked to drive round the country and willingly assented he asked a few careless questions about mara but did not refer to the scene of the previous night basil on his side was acute enough to let sleeping dogs lie so the pair started off about noon for their jaunt in a friendly fashion they talked of this thing and that and all round the shop as the saying is but neither one referred to the scene of the previous night yet a vivid memory of that was uppermost in basil's mind and as he very shrewdly suspected was present also in the thoughts of akira but judging from the man's composure and conversation he had quite forgotten what had taken place basil was pleased with this reticence as it saved him the unpleasantness of explaining himself too forcibly meanwhile patricia drew a long breath of relief when basil drove away with the japanese diplomatist and she went at once to see if mara was all right the girl feeling drowsy was disinclined to chatter but laid back with a smile of ecstasy on her pale face her lips were moving although she did not open her eyes and patricia bent to hear if she required anything but all that mara was saying amounted to a reiteration that she had recalled the past doubtless since the door was now wide open she was in fancy dwelling again in her oriental home moreover she was quite happy so miss carroll seeing that her presence was not necessary to the girl's comfort stole on tiptoe out of the room it was when she came downstairs that she chanced upon theodore in the entrance hall the big man looked both startled and surprised and spoke to her in an excited tone come into my uncle's library at once miss carroll he said touching her arm it has come what has come naturally asked miss carroll puzzled by his tone and look it came by post went on theodore breathlessly and was not even registered there is not a line with it to show who sent it i don't know what you are talking about mr dane uncle wants you to hold it again in your hand and see if you can feel the drawing power you spoke of come come quickly at last patricia knew what he meant and her face grew white have you the mikado jewel she asked leaning against the wall faint and sick for answer theodore unceremoniously led her into the library and she saw mr colpster standing near the window gloating over something which he held in his hand as he moved to face the girl a vivid green ray shot through the subdued light of the large room look look cried the squire stuttering in his excitement and he held up the jade chrysanthemum with the emerald flashing in its centre as the sunlight caught its many facets the mikado jewel gasped patricia and her legs refused to sustain her any longer she sank into a chair how 
long did you get it it came by post by the midday post explained the squire repeating what his nephew had said earlier just carelessly wrapped up in brown paper and directed to me not even registered and packed in a small tin box tied round with a string the postmark is london so it must have been sent through the general post office no district name is stamped on the covering oh wonderful wonderful the luck of the colsters has returned but who sent it asked patricia looking with ill-concealed repugnance at the sinister gem which had indirectly brought about the death of mrs pentreddle the man who committed the crime no no struck in theodore impatiently that's impossible the assassin of poor martha never had it in his possession although as we know he hunted the house to find it the thief who snatched it from you in the park miss carroll must have repented and sent it to its rightful owner and i am its rightful owner said the squire drawing up his spare form to its full height this gin belonged to my ancestor and it is only fair that i should possess it patricia could not approve of this speech as she knew from colpster's own lips that sir beavis had given it to queen elizabeth in exchange for his knighthood but she knew also that it was useless to argue with the squire as he appeared to be obsessed by the jewel to which he ascribed such fantastical powers nothing she was convinced would ever make him give it up and she was confirmed in this opinion by his next words say nothing to basil or akira about the arrival of the emerald he said hurriedly to his companions i don't trust that japanese he thinks that the jewel belongs to the temple of kitsuki so it does remarked patricia quickly colpster snarled and his face became quite ugly and animal in its anger when he turned on her sharply it belongs to me to me to me he cried vehemently and pressed the jewel close to his breast i shall never give it up never 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 tell akira at your peril i don't intend to say a word to the count said patricia retreating a step before his malignant expression it is none of my business but if you are wise you will throw it away why 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 chattered colpster still angry at her opposition and perhaps pricked in his conscience by her words i think it will bring evil upon you you shouldn't let it come into the house she panted and felt that what she said was true theodore started and grew pale granny lee had used almost the same words when he had asked her about the possible danger the old woman had refused to say what the danger was or perhaps as she stated she could not put a name to it but after hearing patricia's remark theodore felt that perhaps the mikado jewel had been referred to as it granny lee said plainly don't let it come into the house and now this girl who also possessed certain powers declared that it should not be allowed to remain under the roof lest it should bring evil in its train you are talking rubbish said theodore roughly and trying to conceal his dismay how can that jewel hurt any one i don't know i can't say but it should not be allowed to remain here squire colpster laughed and laid the lovely thing down on his desk where it flashed gloriously in a ray of sunshine it shall remain here always and bring good fortune to the family he said vaingloriously patricia impelled by some outside power rose and went up to lay a warning hand on the old man's arm there is something wrong she urged consider mr colpster how could the thief have sent the jewel to you unless he knew more about the matter than we think if an ordinary tramp stole it he would have pawned it if a priest of the temple took it he would have carried it as mr theodore suggested back to japan why is it sent to you i don't know that is what puzzles me said colpster and his mouth grew more obstinate than ever but i am going to keep it anyhow what do you say miss carroll turned to theodore the big man winced and grew a shade whiter for the warning of granny lee still haunted his mind 
but the sight of the jewel and the knowledge that he might one day possess it awoke all his covetous nature and he could not make up his mind to suggest that it should be sent away and after all the it to which brenda lee referred might not be this gem i say keep it he remarked drawing a deep breath the luck of the family is bound up in it i am certain the bad luck of the family said patricia bitterly oh you have been listening to akira said the squire crossly he declared that probably the power had been changed how he could know when he never set eyes on the jewel i can't imagine i admit that it is very strange that it should have been sent to me and i can't conceive how the thief either obtained my address or how he knew that i wanted his plunder you might read in the papers said theodore only to be stopped by his uncle who looked at him sharply you talk rubbish my boy i said nothing at the inquest about my interest in the jewel and no one outside our own family knew that i desired it i shouldn't wonder if akira knew said theodore quickly impossible you have heard all he had to tell all the same it will be as well to say nothing about our recovery of the gem while he is in the house i have your promise miss carroll yes i shall say nothing and you theodore good don't even tell mara or basil else they may let out something to that infernal japanese i shall lock the jewel in my safe yonder and he pointed to a green painted safe standing in an alcove of the room now we shall see the luck returning i shall win that lawsuit i shall sell that ruined hay to advantage i shall patricia stopped him i believe everything will go wrong with you how dare you say that girl exclaimed colpster furiously because i feel that i must that jewel has been sent to you for no good purpose i am convinced your sixth sense again i suppose scoffed the squire angrily perhaps said patricia simply privately she believed that the jewel was already beginning to do harm since the old man behaved so rudely as a rule he had always treated her with politeness but now he revealed a side to his character which she had not seen his eyes shone with greed and he showed all the instincts of a miser looking at her and then glancing at his nephew he continued to speak to her hold this in your hand and see if you still feel the drawing power you spoke of in silence patricia took the cold jade blossom and it lay outstretched on her pink palm she did not speak but a bewildered expression gradually took possession of her face the two men who were watching her closely both spoke together moved by a single impulse what do you feel patricia did not reply directly this is not the mikado jewel she said in breathless tones i am sure it is not the squire became pale and theodore looked amazed what makes you think that demanded the latter who was first able to command his voice the drawing power is reversed in this jewel said patricia yes oh yes i feel it quite plainly instead of the power radiating and keeping away evil it is drawing danger towards itself danger gasped the squire and his nephew mindful of granny lee's warning winced visibly danger and darkness wave after wave of fear is coming towards me while i hold the stone and the darkness is swallowing me up oh patricia shivered and deliberately dropped the jewel on the floor take it away i don't like it at all colpster picked up the gem are you sure i wouldn't have let the emerald fall otherwise said patricia who was now trembling as if with cold when i last held it waves of light went out and i felt absolutely safe now tides of darkness press in on me on every side and there is a sense of danger everywhere what sort of danger asked theodore nervously i can't say i can't put my feelings into words it looks like the mikado jewel but it can't be when it feels so different i am certain that it is the mikado jewel cried colpster angrily whether it is or not i can't say retorted patricia backing towards the library door but it is dangerous get rid of it or suffer 
and she went quickly out of the room leaving the two men staring at one another End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the mikado jewel by fergus hume this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter fifteen pentreddle's story squire colster locked the recovered emerald in his safe and again repeated his orders that theodore was to say nothing about it notwithstanding patricia's doubts founded upon the different sensations felt by her when holding the stone the master of beckley hall really believed that he possessed the mikado jewel but he could not comprehend why it had been forwarded to him or how the thief had obtained his address or why the thief should think that he wanted it had the squire been less obsessed by the ornament he might have taken patricia's advice with regard to getting rid of it and in this perhaps he would have been supported by theodore who was feeling uncomfortable since granny lee's statement was always in his mind but as it was he said nothing to urge his uncle to take such an extreme course and the squire certainly never suggested that the gem should be sent away so there it lay in the safe with its influence either for good or bad ready to become apparent patricia on her side put the matter of the emerald out of her mind as she did not like to think about occult matters and moreover had to attend to her duties as a housekeeper a visit to morrow's room in the afternoon showed that the girl was up and dressed and apparently quite her old indifferent self she said nothing about the miko dance in which she had figured so patricia did not remind her of it in any way once or twice she asked where akira was but on learning that he had gone sightseeing with basil she appeared to be satisfied the two gentlemen returned in time for dinner tired and rather damp from the moisture of mists they had encountered on the moors akira expressed himself as pleased with the english country although he shivered when he mentioned the absence of the sun yet as basil reminded him japan did not possess a particularly tropical climate the conversation took place when the soup arrived and as usual when any mention was made of the east mara grew a delicate rose pink and fixed her eyes eagerly on the diplomatist akira gave her an indifferent glance and answered the sailor's speech in the north of japan we have very cold weather but it is sufficiently warm in the south but in any case there is nothing depressing in my country such as a foreigner finds in england it is the english climate to a great extent which has made us what we are count observed colpster seriously i can say the same of japan hardy climates make hardy men sir do not think that i don't admire your country for i do but oh these swathing mists and damp fields he shivered smilingly at least we have no earthquakes put in patricia with a nod ah there you have the advantage of us answered akira wiping his mouth but in some places we can keep earthquakes away what do you mean asked theodore scenting something occult yes akira guessed what he vaguely felt there are laws which control earth waves scientific laws said basil quickly you might not call them so said akira quietly but in the east you know we are aware of natural laws which the west has not yet learned well then tell us how to control earthquakes said the squire with a sceptical look on his face curious you should ask me that sir you should ask miss carroll ask me patricia looked amazed you held the mikado jewel in your hand said akira coolly theodore colpster and patricia exchanged looks and wondered if the japanese was aware that the gem reposed in the library safe it was impossible of course since he had been absent all day with basil yet it was strange that he should refer to an object which was uppermost in their minds i don't understand said patricia doubtfully i can explain miss carroll had you examined the emerald you would have seen the sign of the earth spirit graven thereon that sign shows that a power to control earth forces lies in the stone oh i can't believe that count yet you felt so you told me the radiating rays 
which keep back all earth tremors steady them as it were colpster looked up suddenly i thought you knew nothing about the mikado jewel count he said sarcastically i know very little and told you what i did know replied akira quietly but this conversation about climates revived a memory of what one of the kitsuki priests told me the emerald has had certain ceremonies set over it and has been set on the radiating petals of a jade chrysanthemum thus it possesses a repelling power and was kept in the temple to repel earthquakes from shaking the ground upon which the temple stands theodore stole a glance at patricia who looked sceptical if he suggested in a low voice if the power instead of radiating was drawn to the emerald you speak of count what would happen patricia was not quite sure but she fancied that she saw a subtle smile on the bronzed face of her neighbour but it might have been her fancy or the tricky light of the candles glimmering through their rosy-coloured shades however he replied courteously enough in that case mr dane according to occult law about which i confess i know little the earthquake danger instead of being repelled would be drawn to the place where the jewel lay oh we never have earthquakes here said mara with a gay laugh if the mikado jewel were here and the power was reversed as is suggested by mr dane you would soon feel an earthquake or else this mighty cliff at the back of the house would fall and overwhelm the place theodore shivered granny lee had mentioned that she had seen him crushed as flat as a pancake and he wondered if what akira so idly said could really be true it seemed so for should the jewel have the indrawing power and that it assuredly had if patricia was to be believed there was a great chance that mrs lee's prophecy might be fulfilled for was not the fatal gem in the house at this moment yes theodore shivered again as he became more certain of belief the mikado jewel was the it which the sibyl had warned him should never be allowed to enter beckley hall oh it's all rubbish said the squire who not knowing anything about the occult refused to believe what patricia had told him and what akira had so strangely affirmed and even if such is the case which i don't believe the jewel is not here akira laughed and nodded now you can understand why i warned you not to seek for your family emerald again he said i'm afraid i'll never see it said colpster lying with great ease from what theodore thinks it must be now on its way back to japan let us hope so said akira politely as a native of that country and because my religion is shinto i regret very much that the gem should have been stolen in the hands of ignorant persons it may well bring about deaths you understand he looked at patricia not at all she confessed and really in her heart she scouted the idea that the emerald should be endowed with such malignant powers please do not talk any more about these horrid things i hate them so do i said basil who was growing restless at the way in which his brother eyed patricia let us change the subject which was accordingly done after dinner the squire went into the drawing-room with his family but scarcely had he seated himself to digest his meal when the butler entered with the whispered information that a man wished to see him particularly who is it sims asked the old man impatiently harry pentreddle sir said sims who was an old retainer and knew as much about members of the family as they did themselves colpster bounded to his feet and theodore who was standing before the fire came hastily forward basil and patricia also looked startled as they knew the suggested connection between pentreddle and the giving of the jewel only akira and mara who were talking quietly in a corner appeared unmoved and continued their conversation i'll go at once said the squire eagerly advancing towards the door let me come too uncle asked theodore following no i shall hear his story if he has any to tell myself and then can repeat it to you stay where you are basil and you patricia i shall see harry alone and he went out hastily while those left behind with the exception of the japanese and mara looked greatly disappointed 
Mr. Colster walked quickly into the library and found seated there before the fire a thick-set young man, blue-eyed and fair-haired, with the unmistakable look of a seaman. He rose as the squire entered the room, and, twisting his cap in his strong brown hands, looked bashful. In fact, he was a trifle nervous of his reception, and had every reason to be, for Mr. Colster, who had known him from babyhood, fell on him tooth and nail. "'So here you are at last, Harry,' he said with a frown. "'You have given me a, a lot of trouble to hunt you out. "'What do you mean? Just tell me that. "'I didn't expect this behavior from you, Harry. "'Your mother, my old servant, has been murdered in a most abominable manner, "'and instead of coming to assist me in hunting down the scoundrel who did it, "'you go away and hide. Are you not ashamed of yourself?' Colster thundered out the words largely, but they did not seem to produce much effect on the young man. Harry Pentreddle stood where he was, still twisting his cap, and stared at the squire with steady blue eyes. This composure seemed to be not quite natural, nor did the silence. "'Can you not sit down and speak?' demanded Colster, throwing himself into his usual armchair and getting ready to ask questions harry sat down quietly and still continued to stare steadily i am not ashamed of myself sir because i can explain my conduct fully then do so snapped the squire your mother and father were both my servants and you were born at beckley as your parents are dead i have a right to look after you do you think that i need looking after sir asked pentreddle with a faint smile and a glance at his stalwart figure in the mirror mirror you know what i mean harry i wish to see you married to isa and commanding a ship of your own i intend to help you to get one it is very good of you sir not at all you were born on the estate and now that your future is settled suppose you tell me why you didn't come back before if i tell you sir will you promise to keep what i say secret yes that is in a way i may tell my nephew theodore perhaps my other nephew i can't say i don't mind any one in beckley knowing said harry hastily but i do not wish the whole world to know i am not acquainted with the whole world said colpster dryly so there is no chance of what you say being told to the entire inhabitants of this planet are you satisfied quite well then sir i went to amsterdam to wait for a ship which i know is going to japan she is coming from calais and is late how do you mean late she is a tramp steamer and i know her captain she comes to amsterdam to discharge a cargo and then proceeds to japan i can get an engagement as second mate when she arrives she is expected every day i heard from isa that she wished to see me and so i came over but i shall go back in two days as i can't afford to lose the chance of getting to the far east why do you want to go there harry looked down i can't exactly say he observed in a low voice the squire looked at him keenly then leaned forward do you go to japan to punish the priest who murdered your mother the young man dropped his cap and half rose from his chair only to fall into it again he seemed utterly taken by surprise what priest he faltered you heard me said colpster impatiently the one who murdered your mother a priest of the temple of kitsuki how do you know sir pentreddle stared open-mouthed by putting two and two together martha your mother that is sent miss carroll to get the emerald and she could only have got it from you who had as you told theodore just returned from japan by the way do you know all about the death yes said pentreddle stooping to pick up his cap and thus hide his emotion for his lips were trembling i read everything in the papers and i did not come over because i wished to return to japan and to kill the priest who i believe is the assassin are you sure that a priest of kitsuki killed her yes i feel sure and to obtain possession of the emerald yes i am certain that was the motive for the crime you stole the emerald yes said pentreddle boldly i did he laughed softly it is very clever of you to guess unless my poor mother told you she told me nothing 
snapped the squire with a glare all she did was to ask me for a london holiday she got it and went to her death it was miss carroll you must have read about her in the papers who suggested that possibly you might have passed her the emerald i did although at the time in the fog and darkness i believed it was my mother only when reading about her death did i know that she had been kept at home with a sprained ankle she wait a bit said colpster throwing up his hand you are confusing me i want to hear all from the beginning he paused and seeing that pentreddle looked nervous and was beginning to twist his cap again swiftly made up his mind to a course of action to suggest confidence wait a bit said colpster again and went to the safe when he returned to the table he placed the mikado jewel under the lamp harry rose and bent over it quite speechless with astonishment i thought it was snatched from miss carroll in the park he gasped so it was but someone the thief i presume sent it to me it arrived here without details you are sure that it is the jewel he asked quickly yes it's the jewel right enough answered pentreddle returning to his seat but how did the thief know you wanted it i can't say and i am not even aware if the thief sent it all i know is that there lies the luck of the colpsters and that i have shown it to you so that you may see i repose confidence in you and in return harry the squire leaned forward and touching the young man's knee i wish to hear all about the theft of the emerald from the kitzuki temple pentreddle thought for a few moments while he looked at the winking green ornament under the lamplight then he glanced at his watch and nodded i must get away soon he said brusquely i am staying at hendle and a friend of mine is waiting on the moor road with a trap it won't take me long to tell you everything sir colpster leaned back and placed the tips of his fingers together i am ready to hear you he said quietly and bending his head harry began his story in a hurry my mother as you know sir nursed your nephews mr basil was always her favourite but she never could abide mr theodore she learned from you sir that you intended to leave the estates to the nephew who got back the emerald which is the family luck yes such was my intention well my mother went on the sailor twirling his cap was determined that mr theodore would never inherit so as she knew that i was going to japan she asked me to steal the emerald you had no right to steal it i would have forbidden martha suggesting such a thing said the squire angrily pentreddle nodded i know for that reason my mother kept the affair a secret i readily agreed to do what she wanted as mr basil has always been kind to me whereas mr theodore he halted oh go on said colpster with a cynical smile i know that mr theodore is not a favourite with any one how can he be sir when he behaves so badly he insulted me and-but that is neither here nor there sir and i have no time to talk of that matter i told my mother that i would get the emerald somehow and when i landed at nagasaki i set about looking for it but in what way well you see sir my mother learned from you all about the giving of the emerald to that shogun chap and then she told me how miss mara in some funny way knew that it was at the temple of kitsuki i went there on the chance and a man who kept a tea-shop told me all about the jewel he said that it had been given to the temple by a mikado i thought it was a shogun the shogun who got it from will adams gave it to the mikado and he presented it to the temple explained colpster go on oh that's it is it sir well then he went on twirling his cap i got a sight of the jewel in the temple and stole it but how when it was so carefully guarded i don't think it was guarded over much said pentreddle thoughtfully you see sir the tea-shop man told me that the emerald was under the spell of the earth spirit he called him some queer name i can't remember to keep away earthquakes no japanese would dare to touch the jewel and it lay as i saw on a small altar near the shrine i managed to stop inside the temple after dark and stole it how did you get away said the squire wondering at this daring 
i'll tell you that another day sir as it is getting late i did manage to get away and stow the jewel on board my ship but i was followed followed by whom japanese i suppose they were priests i was nearly knifed at nagasaki and once i was drugged but i had hidden the emerald away and they could not find it when i got to the port of london i thought that i was safe but i soon found that i was dogged there also by whom asked colpster once more japanese said pentreddle again wherever i went i met japanese they swarmed all round me i had written to my mother saying that i would give her the emerald if she came to london she did and wrote asking me to go to the home of art but i knew better than to do that sir i felt certain that if i gave the jewel to my mother she would run a chance of being killed there was one big chap with a scar across his cheek i believe he killed my poor mother what makes you think that harry asked colpster eagerly because i was loafing round the home of art one evening trying to catch a glimpse of my mother and when i saw the beast watching me and the house was the man with the scar a priest he just was said the sailor vigorously a shinto priest i saw him in the temple at kitsuki then i was certain that i was being followed by the priests and wrote and told my mother that i could only give her the emerald secretly she replied saying that the whole household at the home of art had an appointment to see some play i know all that said the squire impatiently skip that well then sir my mother said that being alone she could leave the house at night without suspicion being aroused she told me to meet her at nine o'clock at the right-hand corner of the bayswater side of the serpentine bridge and to look for a red light but of course as i learned later she was kept in by her sprained foot and sent miss carroll why did you not speak to miss carroll i hadn't a chance said harry simply i guessed that i was being followed by the priest with the scar no by a smaller and slighter built chap he dodged at my heels in the fog so i had just time to shove the box into miss carroll's hand into my mother's hands as i thought and then run off in the hope the little beast would follow me he did didn't he for a time then i fancy his suspicions must have been aroused by the red light and by my stopping for a moment i lost him or he lost me in the fog and then instead of returning to my lodging in pimlico i made for limehouse docks i heard next morning of the death why didn't you then come to the home of art what was the good sir remonstrated pentreddle i should only have been knifed by those japanese and there would have been two murders instead of one no sir i wasn't such a fool as my going to the home of art wouldn't have brought my mother back to life i bunked over to amsterdam and lay low then i read in the papers how miss carroll had been robbed of the gem colpster nodded you should have returned then it was of no use sir said the sailor gloomily i knew that the emerald must have got back into the hands of the priests and that they would return to kitsuki in japan i was certain and i am now that the big man with the scar on his cheek stabbed my mother so i waited for the ship i told you about to go back to japan and kill him then isa wrote me and said if you saw me you could help me but pentreddle looked at the emerald it seems to me that things are more muddled up than ever here is the mikado jewel but where are the priests colpster pinched his nether lip and looked perplexed i can't say by the way theodore met you in london yes sir by chance in pimlico why didn't you give him the emerald why harry looked astonished because it was to prevent mr theodore becoming your heir that my mother took all this trouble and so met with her death he rose to his feet i'll go now sir the squire rose also yes unless you prefer to stay here for the night no sir i want to get back to handle i'll come and see you again if you want to hear more i think it will be as well i should like you to repeat this story in the presence of my nephews meanwhile good night and the squire having shaken hands with the sailor sent him away he wished to be alone to think over things and while doing so he put away the mikado jewel in the safe 
ten minutes later he returned to the drawing-room where is count akira akira was tired and went early to bed said basil i'm off too uncle End of chapter fifteen